I began the assembly process by detaching cockpit related components from the sprue using a set of plastic nippers. I prefer using premium nippers such as the Tamiya high grade ones as they ensure a precise and clean cut compared to more affordable alternatives. Cheaper nippers in my experience have a tendency to pinch the plastic during cutting, potentially causing damage to the parts. After removing the components I proceed to clean the parts by eliminating injection molding tabs and the remaining sprue attachment points located like shown here on the rear of the cockpit walls. This ensures I get a proper fit when the components come together later on. Using a basic file, I carefully file down the sprue attachments to ensure a smooth finish. Certain parts may exhibit mold seam lines resulting from the injection molding process, particularly like here on the oxygen bottle. Employing an X-Acto knife blade, I meticulously scratch away the seam lines. If there's any noticeable step like here, I file it down, then use a sanding pad to achieve a seamless surface. To enhance the detail between the mounting brackets on the oxygen bottle, I utilise a UEM scriber to refine the groove. The scriber provides to be an excellent tool allowing for pushing and traditional type pulling actions, making it versatile for precision scribing. To ensure a smooth finish for the scribe groove on the oxygen bottle brackets and eliminate any plastic particles that might be remaining, I apply a thin coat of Tamiya Extra Thin Cement with a brush over the scribe line. This will mount any plastic residue away. Within the kit's additional detail options, one task involves drilling out the lightning holes in the bulkheads. To accomplish this, I utilise the Tamiya Hobby Drill equipped with the appropriate size drill bit. Given the drill's power, especially for smaller holes and fine plastic, I apply a gentle pressure to the trigger, allowing the drill bit to bite into the plastic. I steadily worked my way around the three distinct bulkheads. Afterwards, I employed a hobby blade to clear the debris from the rear of the bulkheads followed by a coating of Tamiya Extra Cement to refine the detailed holes and remove any remaining particles. It's crucial to note that three holes on part A30 should remain untouched as they contain moulded hose details as indicated by the tip of the blade. Ari Models website outlines a few amendments and corrections to the standard boxing. One notable change involves enlarging the antenna hole on part A46 to accommodate the antenna base. During my initial build, I encountered some fitting issues with these components. Tari provides two seat options, one with a molded on harness and another without, for those who are interested in aftermarket alternatives. The harness detail was carefully thinned using a hobby blade and once satisfactory, Tamiya Extra Thin was applied to remove any additional plastic particles. Prepping parts or painting, I find it beneficial to affix all the parts to an alligator clip or blue tag that is attached to a stick. This facilitates easier handling during airbrushing. The copper components underwent priming with a mixture of 40% Mr. Surfacer 1500 Black and 60% Tamiya Lacquer Thinner Retarder Type, applied using an Iwata single action airbrush. Following the primer drying, the cockpit terrier was sprayed in Katari's mixture for Supermarine Interior Green. A blend of two parts Tamiya XF71 and one part X28. After spraying the interior green, I emptied most of the paint cut out and added a few drops of white into the mixture. This was lightly sprayed randomly over the cockpit green areas. The specific green areas were then masked off using various widths of washi tape or Tamiya tape for the following aluminium layers that was about to be sprayed. For layer airbrush metal colours, aluminium was chosen for this stage as it's my preference for their fine pigments and non-flaky metallic finish. To speed up the drying process, a low setting hair dryer was used.
to introduce some colour variation to the cockpit, the armour plating and the control stick were painted with Tamiya XF71 in line with Qatari's specified colour callout options. At the start of the build, all components are stored in a plastic container with a clippable full lid for safekeeping, ensuring all parts are located in one place. Moving on to painting details of the cockpit, I used a wet palette such as this one from Regrass. This method allows me to keep my paints workable for extended periods, ranging from days to up to a week, depending on the paint type. Progressing around the cockpit, I applied one colour at a time with thin coats, occasionally requiring two or three applications on a part. For my favoured brass hue, I turned to the AK True Metal. It's a wax based paste that can be applied in many ways. I thin down the paste using oil thinners and apply with a brush. Given the multiple colours on the seat, I started painting with a base coat of Tamiya XF85. Then I brush painted the necessary seat components with a thinned down interior green, which required multiple applications. For the seat cushions, Vallejo Dark Grey was added to the wet palette and thinned with water and painted. After drying, a glazed mixture of Vallejo Black was added to into the deep crevices of the seams, followed by a blend of Vallejo Dark Grey and Vallejo White, again thinned with water for highlighting the high spots of the cushion. Moving on to the harness's base colour, this was established with the layer of old wood from the Panzer Aces range. This was thinned down with a few drops of water and applied by a brush. A highlight shade was then mixed using Vallejo Iraqi sand and applied to the harnesses at random spots. To bring out the details of the harness, a diluted glaze of black was strategically applied around the details, with additional highlights added where deemed necessary after the glaze was dried. Once again, a glaze of the base colour was applied to the blended shades of the harness, creating a more refined transition and toning down of the stark colour contrasts. Unfortunately, an unexpected reaction occurred with the initial application of the gloss clear coat, which resulted the clear coat cracking. I'm putting this down to an outdated bottle of clear. To rectify this, I immersed the instrument panel in a glass jar filled with dental disinfectant overnight. The disinfectant effectively strips the panel back to plastic, allowing for a fresh start. With the new bottle of gloss clear, all cockpit items requiring decals received a coating. Decals were soaked in cold water for approximately 40 to 60 seconds before being carefully removed from the decal backing paper and applied to the model with a pair of tweezers. Using a cotton bud, I rolled out the water that was underneath the decal and allowed it to dry. No setting solutions were used at all. Upon completion of the decal application and decals drying, a uniform coat of ultra matte varnish from Emo was applied to all cockpit components before my weathering process begins. For the primary weathering process, I rely on Emo's interior wash premix. It's a shade that harmonizes well with most color tones. An example of the dried effect on the interior green and aluminium reveals a balanced hue, not too light, not too dark. I work with the wash amount collected in the cap lid after a thorough shake. I prefer this method because pigments have a tendency to settle rapidly at the bottom of the bottle when working directly from it. 
I play the wash around the surface details, such as this part with the fuel tanks. I'm not overly concerned if it initially appears too light, as additional washes can be added again if necessary. Larger areas like the oxygen bottles on the port side sidewall receive random spots of the wash to break up the uniform base colours. Once the wash appears dry, I use a brush dipped in thinners to blend the wash back towards the past details, ensuring a natural appearance without conspicuous wash blobs. If too much wash is removed, it is easy to reapply and restart the process. For black and dark painted areas, I have found ammo panel line wash stone grey for black to be my go-to, as it dries to a darkish tone that complements black well. This is also applied to small black painted details throughout the cockpit. Ammo Starship Bay sludge oil brusher is thinned down and speckled onto the parts using a toothpick to create small spadaining areas. A black wash is only used to define the slots on the fuel selects levers. To introduce additional wear and weathering to the cockpit, I experimented with ammo Dio dry brush paint range by using the tone bright green. Given its thickness, I wipe excess paint from my brush before lightly dabbing it onto the high wear areas of the cockpit. If a spot appeared too bright, it was easily corrected by wiping away some of the paint with my fingertips. To create aluminium chips, I employed the same method as before, gently dabbing areas to simulate the wear, holding the side walls onto the fuselage halves, aided in placing weathering spots, ensuring a cohesive appearance across the entire cabinets. This process was consistently applied throughout the cockpit. In cases where I applied too much paint, a little bit of water applied by my brush and a wipe with a cotton plug efficiently removed the excess. Throughout the Battle of Britain, Spitfires stood poised on airfields, prepared for air raids of the incoming Luftwaffe. With pilots and crew consistently entering and exiting the cockpit throughout the day, it naturally accumulated dust and dirt. To replicate this effect, dusty earth oil brusher from ammo was diluted and meticulously applied to the seat and floor wells of the cockpit. I opted for a restraint application considering that a significant portion would be concealed, yet there's room for enhanced weathering if you desire it. The control surface control lines were created using Easy Line Elastic Thread. Adhering to the rigging instructions provided, these were fixed into position using CA glue. This essentially completes the cockpit assembly, and I used Tamiya Extra Thin Cement to secure all the components together. In these final steps, I prefer using a regular paintbrush as it can hold more glue on the bristles than the brush supplied within the bottle. This helps when gluing larger components together. This concludes the first few steps. 
Thank you for joining in. Please like and subscribe to support the growth of my channel. Stay tuned for part two. Appreciate it.